best-selling author, spiritual teacher, and host of Higher Self Podcast. She empowers women to align to their true purpose and embrace their divine feminine energy. When I was 21 years old, my body went into perimenopause. So doctors told me I would never be able to have children. I had zero estrogen and zero testosterone. I knew on a deeper level there had to be a reason why. So I just became obsessed with learning about self-healing. There's so many people giving relationship content online, but it's your unique magic sauce. It's how you do it. So your dharma is your soul's purpose. It's the big reason why you are here. And more than just a career or a job or a project, it's really who you are in action doing your purpose just helps you remember who the fuck you are. The dark feminine is really based on what is the darkness? The darkness is the unknown. And the unknown is very scary for most people. Like right now, if you're listening to this, when you tune into the energy of the unknown, what does that feel like for you? Today, I'm thrilled to welcome Sahara Rose, best-selling author, spiritual teacher, and host of Higher Self Podcast. Through her books, like Discover Your Dharma and her community, Rose Gold Goddesses, she empowers women to align to their true purpose and embrace their divine feminine energy. But the reason I wanted to have you on is very, very selfish. I've been following you from before I found my calling and my dharma. I literally was looking at your content and your stuff, and I was posting online about, I don't know, fashion and lifestyle, and I sat down and I used some of the tools that you actually talk about, and I went on to TikTok and I was like, I'm actually going to talk about what my soul calls to, and that's where you found my content, content. so it's like a loop. That is crazy, because to me, you're like the OG bad bitch, so I'm Thank so you. honored to play any uh, role, because then yes. I got a divorce and your content has been helping me. Oh, um, You see how it's cyclical? Because I was oh. always that person on the inside, right? But I was not hiding, but I was like, what does the world want to see? How do I present myself? And I was talking about all these things that didn't align. So for the people who are listening to this and they're like, what are you guys talking about? Can we talk about what Dharma means and like how it presents in people's life and what finding it means and what not finding it means. So we all love Margarita here and she is someone living her, her Dharma. And so how do we know she's living her Dharma? I think the, all, all of us, why we follow her is her unique essence, right? There's so many people giving relationship content online, just like there's so many people talking about spirituality or whatever the thing is, but it's your unique magic sauce. It's how you do it. So your Dharma is your soul's purpose. It's the big reason why you are here. And more than just a career or a job or a project, it's really who you are in action, right? So mm -hmm. in Vedic spirituality, which is like the sister science of yoga and Ayurveda, it's all about that the universe is this massive jigsaw puzzle. And we were each born as souls to play a unique part. And I'm going to get a little bit, this might sound kind of woo-woo for some of you, but just try this on for size. Imagine if your soul you know, kind of came down on this planet and said, this is my big mission. This is my purpose. This is, this is the magic sauce I want to bring to the planet. So I'm going to choose these parents. I'm going to mm -hmm. choose this body, this home where I grew up, these obstacles I'm over going to, going to overcome, even these relationships that are going to fuck me up real bad, but <laughs> I'm going to learn a lot on the other side. And I'm going to choose all of this because it's the exact curriculum that my soul needs to help me embody that dharma. So I was born with a purpose, but now I need to go to the training school for it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like Adele was born with a great voice, but she's put in thousands of hours of training to master that voice. So that's why you see a lot of people in this world are not living their dharmas. They're not living their purposes, even though they have one. Every single person on this earth, there are no extras, has a purpose. But I feel mm -hmm. a lot of us are thinking, well, am I supposed to be a psychologist or a lawyer or this? I like to talk, you know, it's like, it's not a game of life that you pull a card, but rather it is taking, and I have so many different tools, but really taking your unique life experiences, what you're excited about, the mediums that come through you, your unique way of seeing the world and bringing it, in, it all together. And you can see with Margarita here, taking her previous relationships and her experiences and all of these things. It's she, every time I see her videos on TikTok, I already can feel what the essence, what the reminder of it is going to be because she's so living that dharma and we all have our own unique imprinting we are here to make in the universe. So when it comes to your parents that you're born to, people ask me often, oh, how do you know this about men? Or how do you talk about this with confidence? And I'm like, babe, 
I was born with the father I was born with, who wasn't interested in me as a child and still isn't, which is I'm so happy with now because otherwise I wouldn't have known the lessons. What are the lessons you feel your parents gave you and brought you into your dharma? Oh, honey, girl. I think girl, girl, I am deep. So let's go. (laughs) A lot of us spiritual people had that. Would you consider your dad to be a narcissist? Yeah. Yeah. My dad, super narcissistic. Like Mm -hmm. I'm like on the highest level of it. So Mm -hmm. didn't even want to be a father, you know, became one and provided for us financially, you know, but very, very little emotionally. And like, you know, growing up, I would watch Full House. and I'm like, why don't I have a dad like that? And And it's been a huge journey of, you know, trying to heal my relationship with him and become closer with him. And then sometimes I I will feel like I've healed my relationship with my father. And then he'll like be screaming out the news and say just some crazy shit. And I'm just like, but what it has made me learn, I mean, most of us who choose narcissistic parents become empaths. So Mm -hmm. if you're listening to this and you're someone who's, what's an empath? You're sensitive, you're attuned, you're intuitive, you're aware of energy. You can walk into a room. You can feel, okay, some shit went down here. Or I can feel she's saying everything's fine. I can feel something's off. Or I know someone's about to text me when they're going to text me. You're connected to children. You're connected to animals. A lot of us have these high gifts of empathy because we grew up with a parent who was emotionally unattuned, unavailable. And so we actually saw the reflection of what we do not want to be. You know, and also for me, I could tell by the way my dad would walk up the stairs, was he going to be angry today or not? You know, by the way he put down his cup, was he about to burst or not? I I knew like, what are the things that happen right before my parents get into a really big fight? Mm. And you could look at this in the lens of there's a, there's a trauma related to that, but our traumas are related to our dharmas because those traumas give us the unique schooling that only that thing can give us. And then when I'm able to realize that even that, while on a human level, I don't deserve that. No one deserves anything bad happening on a human level. But I know from who I've become, from becoming someone who my empathy is my superpower, my gift, that I'm able to see patterns and things, that I'm able to listen to people, that I'm able to hold conversations that only would have been possible with a father exactly like that. And also mm-hmm. diving into relationships that I, I had to, like you, go through the narcissistic relationship thing. My marriage ended due due to infidelity and it was, he was a more covert narcissist. So I would not have been able to tell. And I know you have a similar um, Mm -hmm. type story and I'm so grateful for that too, because it's like certain lessons will only learn by going straight in, you know, it's like you can read it in those lessons. Yeah. You had that with your father and you become so crystal clear and attuned to men or maybe not men, women, whoever you are with in the way they put their cup down, the way they do everything. I see a lot of messages of women coming in. um, I can feel that he's a little bit off. He's a little bit depressed. What do I do? How do I make him happy? How does an empath who is like you or I, who's trying to find their purpose and trying to find that freedom, unlock themselves from zoning in on people and becoming obsessed and anxious about their relationships? What was your journey with that? Yeah. So there's, you know, everything in life has, is a dichotomy, right? So there's a fine Mm -hmm. line. So I remember in my relationship, I was, you know, like I was the golden retriever, I would Mm -hmm. say. Like I was obsessed with, I was 24 years old and I was just obsessed with him, you know? And so I never really put him through like, are you meeting my needs? I I didn't even think I had relational needs, you know? I was just like, I met my husband, that's it, game over. And Mm -hmm. um, so looking back on that, I already gave him the title of a husband, Mm -hmm. but he didn't have to do anything to become the husband. I just saw him as that. And I would say also, I mean, I thought he was going to be the opposite of my father because he was more attuned to how I felt compared to what I had experienced. But I do believe on a deeper level, we still often have to go into those relationships firsthand to really like learn that. I remember, and I've never really shared this, but you know, at my wedding, Like my, you know, your dad is supposed to walk you down the aisle. And my dad was like, so just not present with me at all. He's like trying to have a small talk with the lady styling my hair. Like I'm literally about to walk down the aisle. It's like, aren't you supposed to be giving me like words of advice or something, you know? And he's just like, what kind of trees grow here? Blah, blah, blah. And, and I remember just being so infuriated. And as I was walking down the aisle, I cried, but it was like this cry of like, get me away from my father. 
Like I'm so excited to create a new family that's not him. But it was like I was running from the arms of one narcissist into another. You know, it just, it wasn't as aware. And how do women stop from doing that? Because I was lucky in terms of the fact that, like you said, I had a similar relationship before my marriage where he ended up cheating. I put all my needs aside. So in essence, I think I was lucky or maybe it was just my path, but I was attracted to a person who ended up cheating on me. And all I was doing is putting my needs aside and jumping through hoops like the golden retriever, because all I thought about and cared about is how to maximize his happiness. And then I met my husband and I've never shared this as well, but I was in the same pattern. I hadn't healed because I feel healing is relational. You've got to do it together. But I was fortunate in the fact that he was somebody who looked like somebody who's narcissistic and avoidant, but wasn't actually. He's just somebody who's very involved in his own project, very um, almost inspiringly unaffected by other people. And I thought like in my energy, I suppose that I was getting with somebody who was going to reject me also, and I was going to chase, but really he is not that person. But if I was somebody else, and what would you advise to women who have that pattern of keeping going for that man who they're going to please. And because they're an empath, they've got no other way of being. What what would you say they should do? Yeah. So this has been a, a journey for me over the past two years and something I've really found my way on the other side. So the mm. first thing is if you are someone that keeps attracting, and when people say I keep attracting, it means you're attracted to. So if you're someone mm. that keeps being attracted to emotionally unavailable men, it honestly, and I know you don't want to hear it, and I know you're going to say this isn't true, but it means you're emotionally unavailable to yourself. The reason mm -hmm. being is you really can't sustain a relationship with someone who's giving you breadcrumbs because you're living in your fantasy. you know. And oftentimes mm -hmm. what we do as women is we decide if this guy chooses me, then I'm important because this guy has the money or the career or the the fame or the whatever the thing is. So, or for a lot of women, height <laughs> looks. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I, I was there too. So we choose this guy who feels like he's a little bit out of our reach, but if he chooses me, then that means all the stories I've told myself as a kid that I'm unlovable are therefore not true based on this person choosing me. And then we live on these little breadcrumbs, like he watched my story. And like the rest of our day, oh my God, he watched my story. He watched my story. Wait, but he stopped at the third story. What did I post on the third story that made him go away? And then we're like doing mental gymnastics, trying to figure it out. We're like adding him to our close friends and we're like doing close friends photos. So he'll see. And I do think that's a stage that a lot of women go through. But if you stay in that perpetually, it's like, do you actually really want a real relationship? Because a real relationship mm. requires you being real. And so my journey really showed me all the ways that I was not presenting myself as real. I was presenting myself as this dream girl who was perfect and low maintenance and chill and this and that. And, and also I think what happens a lot of times after a breakup is you have like your glow up, you know? So for yes. me, I was just like presenting myself like hair, makeup, lashes, like everything amazing. But it was actually through sitting with plant medicine of ayahuasca that it showed me. It was like, how is your man even going to find you when you're not even showing what you really look like? And it's only until you love that little, for me, 11 year old girl. That mm -hmm. was the time of my life that I felt fat, ugly. My parents were fighting. I had a crush on this boy. He didn't like me back. That was like, you know, when so there's a stage of your life, you when you look at the childhood pictures of, you're like, ew, I was ugly then. That was my stage. And I know we all have it. And it showed me until you can genuinely love that 11 year old girl in you and the parts of you that are still her, when you feel like you've gained weight, when you feel like your cheeks are too red, when you feel it, until you can love that, how do you expect someone else to love you? And it also showed me on a deeper level that unconditional love that I was desiring so deeply is not a, relation, a romantic relationship. It's the love of a mother. And I was mm. wanting someone to love every part of me, my shadows of me, my this, my that. That's a mother's love. That is, that is yeah. your mother to you, whatever the relationship is like. And, and you to your children, I know you have, you have children, so you feel that. And I feel often we're looking for that mother's love in our romantic relationships. 
And we have to go on that journey of being our own inner mother for ourselves. So these, these things, and it's, and it's not a one and done. It's like meditating on that inner child, finding a picture of you at that age that you felt unlovable, staring at her, talking to her. When you're doing something cool in life, bringing her along with you, be like, Hey, little Margarita. Hey, little Sahara. Like right now we're like, on a podcast. Isn't this so cool? Like people like to hear us talk. Like, isn't that so amazing? Like, look at who we've become. And even times that you're feeling scared, like, oh my God, is he pulling away? Is this relationship going to work? It's your little inner girl that's scared. She's scared. Am I going to be abandoned? Am I going to be alone? And talking to that little girl and it's actually that that's going to heal and shift the relationships that we're in. So I noticed there was definitely a couple of these like more emotionally unavailable fuck boy, that kind of guy. But after a while, I started attracting empath men, <laughs> like Ooh. men who are very attuned to needs. Very, And then that was another mirror for me of like, whoa, 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 this is a lot, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And more recently starting a new a new relationship and like just this morning, for example, I was feeling a little bit like, and, and right now he, he, he lives in another country and blah, blah, but I was feeling a little bit like for me, mornings are such an important time to connect and he's in a different time mm -hmm. zone. So it's just like, we're on a different connection. So I went into like in my notes app, writing the breakup letter, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, this yeah, isn't yeah, going to yeah. work out, da, 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 like going Sunday. straight into that. that. <laughs> and then I actually just played like a meditation and I just connected to my heart. It was my little girl that was so afraid that this isn't going to work out. So let me end this right now. Cause it's probably not going to work out and we're going to break each other's hearts. And I don't, I, I feel bad breaking his heart. And so I don't even know if I want to be in this. So let me just end this right now. And it's that still that little girl. And it's like reminding yourself that, by the way, in love, even if you love each other for the rest of your lives, hearts are going to be broken and there's no running away from that. But when we realize that we can just grow through that, we can actually say, and so eventually to him, I told him, I was like, you know, mornings are such a sacred time for me. And, and, and one of my deep like relational needs is intimacy. And that's totally okay if that's not your your jam. And and maybe we won't be compatible in that way. But I just wanted to speak it because I think it's important in starting a relationship to just share it with honesty. I didn't do the breakup letter, but I also didn't ignore it. And and just for the rest of the day, he's been so much more like telling yeah. me what he's doing and checking in and this and that. And it's like, I feel we jump to these conclusions so often we're like obsessed or like blocking and like letting ourselves exactly. be in the intricacy and the in-between. I think it's the maternal love, like what you said, that little girl, I was a 12 year old girl, every feeling of inadequacy, fatness, which is an abstract word, but that's how I felt when I was 12. I was an immigrant as well. I had an accent just, which is funny that we're podcasting now and people like to hear us talk because, you know, that story is very real. But in that moment when you wanted him to contact you in the morning, that is also a call from yourself to your own maternal self to look after you. That's where I find that, you know, you're like, oh, I want his intimacy in the morning. Where is the maternal side of you that's going to be there for you? And when I found that for myself, when I was like, actually, I'm good by myself. I'm good to be here for myself, not by myself. That's the wrong expression, but I'm going to look after me. Suddenly people start to come in and you expressing, hey, I need you to, you know, communicate with me. Is that maternal love for your, that little girl being like, hey, this little girl needs communication. So we're going to do it or, or you can miss me with that. You know what I mean? So that's an amazing story from that empath. If somebody is, um, dating and they're a woman like you and they are so aligned with their purpose, it can come across as very powerful. How do you find dating as a woman who is in her alignment and what do men react like to you? Oh, girl, it is definitely can be more challenging. And it's funny because people look at me often and they're like, it must be so easy for you because you have a huge audience. So you probably have guys DMing you all the time. I'm like, I really barely ever do. Because first of all, my audience is all women. And also a lot of men are intimidated. You know, if they see, it's actually really interesting. I read in a book that it's like something in, in psychology, but if a woman was presented to with an opportunity to cheat, she would be more likely to cheat with like 
the super famous athlete or movie star or rock star or something mm -hmm. like woman, we are drawn to fame. Whereas a man, if he was given an opportunity to cheat between like a Kim Kardashian or like the street cleaner, but she was pretty good looking, he would choose the mm -hmm. good looking street cleaner. So a lot of men actually are quite intimidated by fame because they know that a woman that has more notoriety is going to have higher demands. Because men compare themselves to the woman and she's not looking up to him and men want to be looked up to. So Exactly. So it was really interesting because I would find myself dimming my light. So mm -hmm. I remember there was this guy I in, in London I matched with and I we he was like, what's your Instagram? And I kind of just ignored the question. And then again, he's like, what's your Instagram? I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, so if I gave him my Instagram and I saw he followed me and I like muted him from my stories because I didn't want him to like know. Yeah. And I just was like, how eventually I went on a date with him and it was like complete friend vibes. And then I unmuted him from my stories. And in my head, I was like, he's going to think I'm too out there. You know, I'm like dancing. I got music videos. I got this. And he was like, he was like Pakistani. So I was like, he's going to be conservative. I unmuted him from my stories after I realized it was a friend vibe. This guy's my number one fan. He loves <laughs> everything that I do. And here I went creating this whole story. So I share this because you'll also be surprised by how many men are extremely inspired by it or like that's mm -hmm. so hot that you have your own thing going on you know especially a lot of like really powerful men they don't want a woman who's like constantly doting on them and you know why didn't you text me back and they don't they don't have time for that you know so Correct. a lot of like the person that i'm seeing right now very very successful man definitely in his alpha man and it's so attractive to him that I'm like, it's like power couple, you know, it's like you could bring mm -hmm. me around somewhere and I can hold a conversation. And, and I think that it, it's also really necessary for women to have her own dharma because we can get so caught up in our emotions. We can get so caught up into micro analyzing the situation that happened. And sometimes it's like doing your purpose just helps you remember who the fuck you are. And then you come yeah. back to it with so much less of that fieriness. Yeah. A lot of girls who are struggling and women are, it's because they don't have that dharma and that path and the purpose. Let me tell you, sometimes I want to fixate on stuff too. I want to be like, why didn't he text me? Even with my husband, it just, you just start to cycle. But then I've got to be here on this podcast. I've got to do this. People are waiting. I'm, you know, and I'm like, ah, forget him. And then suddenly he reappears all excited and happy to be with me. And that's always the way it works. When it comes to feminine energy, I get this question a lot. And I just wanted to, um, talk about it with you building a business but being in your feminine energy are those two things mutually exclusive or can it happen do you have to go into your masculine and be very driven to make it happen because you are prolific in what you've done thank you you can absolutely create a business from your feminine i think it's expanding the definition of what feminine is so most of what we see on youtube or tiktok even it's like to mm -hmm. be feminine is just to talk like this and be really submissive and you know guys don't want it if you make money and guys don't like this and guys don't like that and it's like that is an aspect of the feminine and then there's another aspect of the feminine that's like kali ma who's wild and untamed and free and raw and liberated and there's the aspect of her that's durga the fierce war fierce warrior ass who fucking slays demons on mm -hmm. her on her on her lion and there's Saraswati, the goddess of creativity, who's channeling arts and beauty and expression, and Lakshmi, who's just dripping in gold and abundance and money. And these are all aspects of the feminine. So mm -hmm. I feel our society has taken like 1950s housewives and we're like, that's the feminine. It's like, no, that's, and, and also it's the wounded feminine. You know, the wounded feminine is manipulating other people to try to get what she wants. The empowered feminine is in her queen energy. You know, the priestesses mm -hmm. back in the day were the woman who would use their spirituality, their sensuality, their intuition, and the men would come to her for guidance. And I see a lot of women, they're like, well, I want a man that completely takes the lead. But here's the thing. We women, we are the leaders in love. We are the leaders of love. We are the ones who are more attuned to the frequency of love. We can feel when something's off in the relationship sooner. And so, yes, while I think we all have a fantasy about a guy that knows us better than we know ourselves and, you know, can stare into our souls and tell us everything we need, that fantasy is what's keeping so many women unhappy in their relationships and so many women perpetually single.
And the reality mm -hmm. of it is, is like we naturally, we have wombs, you know, mm -hmm. carrying a womb means we carry the hologram to create life. So we are going to be more attuned to that frequency. So bringing it to business, we can channel and manifest through our womb spaces, through our creativity, through our divinity. For me, I, I'm someone that, and I, I'm also a Capricorn, so I will say that, but I don't follow a schedule. I really go for my, my, where is inspiration taking me today? And sometimes inspiration is taking me and I'm writing and writing and writing. And sometimes I'm in a flow where I'm like just answering a bunch of emails and sometimes in a flow that I'm just creating a bunch of content. So following that flow, following that wave and just getting in the right energy state for it. You know, sometimes it's taking a walk or rolling on, rolling around on your yoga mat or doing something to get you into that flow. And maybe the first 10 minutes, you have to like force yourself to start writing or something you don't want to. Mm -hmm. But then I find the floodgates unlock. I do feel there is an element of the masculine that is needed in creating a business, which is creating that containment, that structure. So, you know, I was one on one coaching for like seven plus years, making okay money, but not really at the beginning of it, quite broke. And it was only when I decided to consciously be like, well, how does an online business work? Like, how do I actually set up, you know, a funnel? What is a discovery call? Like starting to learn these things that at first I was like, ew, business, I don't want to touch you with a 10-foot pole. Same. That once I started to actually learn those things, and, and I did have to kind of shift into what you might call masculine, but I could also call it fierce feminine, of learning how to create that containment and structure within for myself. I went from, I was living in a $2 a night hut in India broke to, I have a multiple seven figure profit a year business now where I pretty much do whatever I want at this point. But there were years of my life that I had to learn the business things. And now I can, if needed, get in the back of my website and fix things around or do the email list or whatever the thing is. I have a team that does it, but I could only hire that team that does it because I had to learn how to do it myself. Right. And I think a lot of us, yeah. it's the wounded feminine. We have that fantasy. So many women, I would just want someone to just manage my whole business for me. Can someone just, just run it for me? It's like, we're not on the days of Oprah anymore that they're like, here you go, Margarita. We're going to give you a show, a producer, a manager, this, that, that. It's all done for you. Just show up. It's just not the way that it works. And that's a blessing because now we can have so many different voices out there. You can become your own Oprah. You can literally get a $10 microphone. You got your iPhone. You can have your own TV show starting tomorrow. So it's going to be the battle of who wins the battle of their minds, the battle of their consciousness, these perceived limitations that we have, this, this, you know, wall that's not even real. That if the only difference between Margarita and I is we just decided to start. And so mm -hmm. don't feel like, oh, I'm going I'm to lose myself in my masculine if that happens. But rather it's like, if I've only walked with my right foot my entire life, I need to sometimes learn how to walk with my left foot. Yeah. Then I can learn with my left foot and then I can do both. And we need both yin, exactly. yang, shiva, shakti. It's amazing. I think I remind women a lot that I used to coach like you and that was all fine, making a bit of money. Okay, cool. And then I had my first child and my business brain turned on, not because I became a masculine man, but because that fierce feminine turned on. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to make money for my child. And not only that, I realized the difficulty of looking after a child and running a business. And if anything, I want to model to women that you can do it and that you can be there for your family or stay at home and be that kind of, like you said, epicenter of it's your role. I tell them all the time to create the emotional stability in your home. And you can only do that if you're also running a business for yourself and you have some control. I saw you talk about dark feminine energy and I want to talk about it. What is the misconception about the dark feminine when they're all like mm, femme fatale, you know, she's just so aloof. What is the real dark feminine when it comes to spirituality? I feel you really embody dark feminine energy beautifully. Mm -hmm. So of course she's wearing a black shirt today, but the dark feminine, you know, a lot of people think it's the seduction techniques, the how to get him to text you back, that kind of stuff. And a lot of people brand their things as dark feminine, but the dark feminine is really based on what is the darkness? The darkness is the unknown, you know, and the unknown mm -hmm. is very scary for most people. Like right now, if you're listening to this, when you tune into the energy of the unknown, what does that feel like for you? So what does it feel like for you, Margarita, unknown? 
comforting for me mm. because I'm quite used. To, I, I like the I like the feeling of the unknown. It's comforting for me. It makes me feel safe. But that's from working on it for a long time. Like a true dark goddess right there. Yeah. <laughs> so most yeah. people, the unknown is scary as shit. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh my god, like. I would rather be in a comfortable cage that I know every corner than an, an unknown thing that anything can happen. Mm -hmm. But if Better any, the devil you know. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. But if anything can happen, then anything can happen. It's limitless possibilities. The dark void is the dirt. It's the soil. It's where all life grows from. It's the space. Mm -hmm. It's the cosmos. It's where this, the solar system and the galaxies are born. It's the womb, the hologram that has created all life. All creation comes from the dark. So a woman mm -hmm. in her dark feminine energy is in touch with that. She's not afraid of the shadows. She's not afraid of the pain. She's not afraid of those periods in her life where the rug is swept under her feet because she's like, bitch, now I got a flying carpet, <laughs> you know, because she's learned mm -hmm. that. She's gone through dark nights of the soul. A dark night of the soul is when oftentimes your biggest nightmare happens. You're, you're thrown into the abyss. You know, for me, finding out about the infidelity in my marriage, for someone else it could be a health crisis, for someone else it could be whatever the thing is, where your life was going one way, wasn't perfect, but you're okay with it. And then the universe, out of love, said, you are capable of so much more. And because mm -hmm. you're not going to make this change in your life, I'm going to get involved. And even though yes. this feels like the worst thing that's ever happening, it's going to be the best. And everything you genuinely want is on the other side of this unknown. And the thing that happens in the unknown is at first we're like holding on to the sides. We're like, oh my God. It's like, you know, when you're on a roller coaster, you're like holding on to the roller coaster for your dear life. But you can just decide, you know, I'm on this roller coaster regardless, you know, this roller coaster of life. So I could put my hands up, radio on, and enjoy it. Because it's going to take me on a ride. It's just, am I resisting it or not? So when you start to get a little bit more comfortable in the unknown, like you are, then all of a sudden you realize that your life becomes more magical the more you're in the unknown. That you're like, huh, mm -hmm. I thought this was going to work. I guess it's not working. Must be something better. Because Whoa. it only mm -hmm. gets better. That's just what it is. I keep getting hotter. My relationships keep getting, getting better. I keep getting richer. Everything just keeps getting better all the time. And so it is. And so if you decide, and so it is, that's what it will be, you know? So when I found out about the infidelity, even though I had zero evidence of this, I said, this will be the reason why I have the greatest love of all time. Whereas most people will say, this is going to be the reason why I can never trust again. This is the reason why I'm going to have post-traumatic betrayal, PTSD. It was crazy. The Instagram ads I was getting, I was like, oh my God. I love that. And I was like, nope, this is going to be the reason why my heartbreak is going to be the reason why my heart will open more than it ever has before. And mm -hmm. even though I had no evidence of it, I was in that unknown. And when you're in the unknown, spirit starts to speak to you a lot more. You start to notice all these synchronicities. It's like someone sends you a message that's exactly what you need to hear. Maybe you listen to this podcast. You don't even know. Maybe it's your first time ever listening to this podcast. And it's like speaking to your soul right now. And this is all your highest self, which really is a future version of you on your highest timeline, giving you those breadcrumbs that are guiding you. So being in your dark feminine energy is being aware of this and realizing that the shadows, the unknown is actually going to bring you towards everything you ever really wanted. That's incredible. I mean, I just want to round out and say, if you want to know more about Dharma, you can go on your websites, but I found you through Ayurveda. And I want to touch on it for, for myself selfishly, because I think sometimes when you're not in your alignment, your body speaks to you through not necessarily illness, but discomforts, back pain, whatever it is. And could you tell me a little bit about how you started, how you began um, talking about doshas and what they mean, just so I can learn more about it? Thank you. <laughs> I started for because of my own health challenges. When I was 21 years old, my body went into perimenopause. So doctors told me I would never be able to have children. I had zero estrogen and zero testosterone. And because of that, I would have osteoporosis and be on tons of prescription medications from antidepressants, hormone replacement therapy, the list goes on. And I knew on a deeper level, there had to be a reason why, but they just said, I don't know, sometimes this just happens. 
And so I just became obsessed of, with learning about self-healing. And that brought me to Ayurveda, which is the world's oldest health system and the sister science of yoga based on the mind-body connection. And what drew me to Ayurveda was I took a quiz and I can share my dosha quiz. But when I took this quiz, it described my personality. It was like, you're creative, you're artistic, you think outside the box, you're idealistic, you love to travel, but also like you can overthink and get anxious and have insomnia. And then it described my body in the same archetype. It was like bloating, gas, constipation, amenorrhea, which means not getting your period, low hormones, cold all the time, dry skin, dry hair, dry nails. All, I was like, this is just my autobiography. Like when I die, just read this description out loud. And <laughs> I'm like, I need to know everything about this because I would go to the gastroenterologist. They would say, take this. The endocrinologist, they would say, take that. And here's this one thing that describes my body, my mind, my spirit, all of it in one category. And I'm like, I've never feel, felt so seen. So mm -hmm. I just became obsessed with learning everything I could about it and ended up studying Ayurveda in India for two years and, you know, writing numerous books on Ayurveda, such as Eat, Feel Fresh, Idiot's Guide to Ayurveda, and we can link those as well. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it today is there's really no one size fits all approach, but also your body, those discomforts that you mentioned, those symptoms are really your soul speaking out to you, telling you areas of your life that are out of balance. So for me, I didn't have my period for two years because I was deeply out of touch with my feminine energy. You know, um, for someone else, they might have really bad back pain because they're carrying the weight of the world. For someone yeah. else, they may have really bad digestive issues because they're not digesting life. So our mm -hmm. bodies are really giving us the symptoms of what is deeper, on a deeper level happening within our souls. And ultimately, the, the only way we can heal is to come in alignment with our dharmas. Because until we come in alignment with our dharmas, something will be off. Spirit will always be nudging us. You know, before I started my podcast, my, I would get these horrible throat pains. I would cough. And spirit was like, speak, girl, speak, speak. But yeah. I was like, I'm afraid. I'm a writer. I'm not a speaker. And then even at the beginning, I would write down everything I wanted to say and read it off the piece of paper, you know, because I didn't trust <laughs> myself yeah. in speaking. And ever since I started the podcast, I've never had any kind of throat issue again. So That's I share crazy. this because we so focus on the acute issue, but everything has a deeper spiritual reason behind it. Can you just share with me the three doshas, just for anyone interested, and Absolutely. what they present like? And can you tell from looking at a person what they are, aka me? Yeah, so three <laughs> doshas. The word dosha means energy. So they are mm -hmm. vata, which is air, pitta, mm -hmm. fire, kapha, earth. So a person that has air qualities, so if I was like, oh my God, she's such an airhead, what, mm -hmm. how would you describe this person? Like the typical blonde, sorry, blonde's airhead, you know, flitting around, doesn't know what she wants, you know, confused, trips over. Right. That kind of person. Exactly. Head in the clouds, space cadet, you know, we have language for it. Mm -hmm. So this airy person, likely they're going to be, you know, on, on the good side, they're creative, they're artistic, maybe they have a cool style, they're always changing things up, maybe they live in like Venice Beach, LA, you know, but then the mm -hmm. other side are the things you mentioned, maybe they, you know, have a lot of ideas, air, it's like a tornado in their thoughts. Yeah. So if you are someone, and that was my, my dosha, that I would change my mind a lot. So I'm like, oh, I want to do this for a living. Oh, no, now I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. I would, I would like ask strangers. I'm like, do you know what I should do with my life? Like, I have no idea. Oh you know? I always tell women, just decide for yourself. Use a month to just decide solely for yourself. Don't ask anyone if you want to find out who you are. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I had to go on an advice detox, which now I'm on one with men as well. Because as women, we so we're like, I don't know. Like, you tell me. And that, that's a very vata air, airy thing to do because it's you're leaving your body, right? So the air quality is creative, artistic, idealistic, travel, think, thinks big, big picture oriented, shadows, anxiety, insomnia, changes mind often scattered. Mm -hmm. In the body, mm -hmm. bloating, gas, constipation, cold, you know, the air is mm -hmm. cold, dry, eczema, and then how they tend to look. So we each have like uh, it's called the prakriti, a natural born constitution. So you may have been born and we're all, all three of these doshas. So you may have been born okay. primarily air, secondarily fire, lastly earth. Maybe your air and fire are pretty similarly. Your earth is lower. Maybe your earth is high. It's like, we're all, it's not 
some of us are very much one dosha. Some are like really 10% of people are equal with all three. So you're born with that, but then your diet, your lifestyle, where you live, where you travel, what's happening in your life changes it. That's called their vikruti. So we can tell often what someone's prakriti is, their natural born constitution by the shape of their face, by the size of their wrist, by the shape of their hips. So a vata person, an air person we were just talking about, is going to have mm -hmm. often a long face, mm -hmm. gaunt cheeks, long limbs, like a mm -hmm. ballerina body, a marathon runner body. Think Steve Jobs, Natalie Portman, Kira Knightley, uh, Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, that, that body type. So we see like a lot of, a lot of like artists have that, like people yeah. who forget to eat you know, like yeah. that kind yeah. of body type. So I don't, I, that's not, I mean, I'm so I'm small boned, but I'm not exactly that because I have the other ones. A little thing that you can do is checking the size of your wrist. So mm -hmm. can you put your hand around your wrist? Now, is there a lot of space or is it just about equal oh, or I is it, I do. What is wrong with me? There you go. Or is it hard to touch? That's okay. Good. It's hard to touch. Interesting. To touch, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if there's a I lot of- I naturally feel like I fall into, if I neglect myself and everything, I go earth kapha energy because I'm that kind of energy. But my predominant feels like pitta a lot of the time. I'm very- Yeah, you fiery. definitely have a like a pitta in your personality. But what mm, that just yeah, showed us is that you have mm -hmm. earth kapha in your body. So, yeah, that's, so that's the right. body structure. So if you have a lot of space that's between your hands and your wrist, that's yeah. a vata skeletal structure. So mine is a vata skeletal structure. If it's just touching like this, it's a pitta, fire one. If yeah. it's not quite touching, it's a kapha, earth one. Yeah. Si size of That's the hips. Body. People who have yeah. like, I have a very straight body. So that tends mm. to be vata people. People who are a little bit m just kind of regularly proportioned is more pitta, fire. People who have like, like more pear-shaped hourglass yeah. bodies is more of that earth kapha, like a Kim, Kim uh, Kardashian, Marilyn Monroe, yeah. et cetera. So I sadly don't have that attribute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have narrow hips, but oh well. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like different. It's, 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 it's always mixed, different yeah. in different areas as well. So like a kapha, a kapha face as actually, I have quite a kapha face. So the kapha is the earth one. So they tend to have like rounder faces, softer features, baby-like features, big eyes, big lips. They have smooth skin. Pittas, the mm -hmm. fire one, tend to have angular jaws, um, redness in their skin, oiliness, acne. Mm -hmm. And then vatas, it's more of that like long, um, sometimes more sunken in, sunken in features. It's fascinating. I love that practice. It's so, so interesting. And when you align also the foods you eat, I read your books as well. It's just incredible what it can do, just aligning and tweaking these ancient practices and talking about ancient practices, something I've never really touched on or have no knowledge on is past lives. Can you talk to me about your experience with past lives and how you, what your thoughts are on it? Ooh, so past lives are one of the big things that brought me into my spiritual journey. So I believe, and in, in Vedic spirituality, it's it's none of our first rodeos here, you know, especially if you're listening yeah. to this podcast, like you've been on this planet before. This is not intro level shit right here. So our past lives are aspects of ourselves that on a higher level are simultaneously happening right now. So how do we find them? What historical periods are you drawn to? What countries? Mm -hmm. Are there, is there any music? When you listen to music from that culture, you just come alive. You watch a movie that's set in this time period. It feels like you've been there. Or maybe you've gone into a home or somewhere and you're like, oh my God, I've been here before. Maybe it's just a certain practice really resonates for you. A certain dance or a language came through you very easily. So I know some people... French came very easily for them. They love Paris. It's like walking down the streets of Paris, it feels like they've been there before. Other people, mm. they are so repulsed by Paris. And the last mm. thing they want to learn is French. It feels like some shit maybe went down there in a negative way. You know, some countries right. you're really drawn to, some countries you're repulsed by, some countries you're neutral by. So for me, I'm Persian in this lifetime, but so deeply drawn to India. I mean, even my career has really been sharing Vedic spirituality. Yes. So many past lives in India. Like, I mean, my my college boyfriend was Indian and lived in India. And when I'm there, I'm just like, even though people 
often are like, India is so chaotic. It feels like home for me. And all of this wisdom almost feels like secondary for me. Like when I was writing my books, I would often just look out the window and my fingers would just type. And I didn't even know what I was writing. And it would be like the gunas, the sadgunas, like very specific Vedic information was coming through me that I was channeling from my past lives. So start to write down like these historical periods, characters, and then start to create archetypes. Like if I were an archetype in that time, what would it be? You know, was I... Um, a 12 year old girl who is dancing and drumming in Kenya with this big wide smile? Was I this samurai fighter in Japan who, you know, mm -hmm. only wanted to fight for good? Was I, you know, and start to create mm -hmm. these different storylines for yourself. You can even give them names. And I find that often like our interests will shift us towards different past lives. So, and we have, and it's, infinite past lives. We can't really quantify it, but I find in this lifetime, there's a couple lives that you're really working with, you know, like, and there might be mm -hmm. periods of your life that you're like really channeling from that lifetime. So maybe you go through like a bachata dancing phase and you're really channeling from that like lifetime you've had in Dominican Republic, or, you know, you are working a lot with shamanism and plant medicine. You're channeling from your life, life as a Mayan indigenous elder, or you're being called to Egypt and Egyptian mysteries, and you're channeling from your lifetime as an Egyptian priestess. So I find the more we have access to them, they start to take us on a journey and we start mm -hmm. to, they, it's like unfinished business from that lifetime that we're here finishing. Mm -hmm. So we're getting support from that lifetime. We already have a huge level. So like spiritual people, we call, they call us old souls because we have been studying this wisdom for so long, for so many different lifetimes that we're, our starting point is where pe a lot of people will never even get to. And we can go into soul ages. Like there are some infant souls here on this planet who it is like their first kind of couple of lifetimes that it's all about survival. We've got young souls where it's all about like my wants, my house, my country, my flag, yeah. mine, yours, good, evil, right, wrong. If the church doesn't say it, you can't. It's like that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. I think we can all recognize that. We have mature souls who are like, wow, like when I go to the museum, I feel some kind of way, but I don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. But you know, oh, I like the, the opera, you know, and it kind of is like they are drawn to arts and literature, but it doesn't really have a spiritual side to it. Mm -hmm. And then the old souls are like asking conversations like this, like what is the meaning of life and, and yeah. noticing these parallels. So we can also see how evolved our souls are from the contemplations that we're having. It's funny. I was sitting with my mom and she was annoyed about something and she vis visibly shows that she's annoyed in her face. And I'm like, why are you showing me? Why are you showing that you're annoyed? She goes, what do you mean? Because I'm annoyed. And I'm like, yeah, but how is that going to change anything? Like, it's not going to change the circumstance. Like, nobody's going to watch your face. And then, you know, I have these contemplative questions. And she's like, what do you mean? But I'm annoyed. And I realize in that moment that the questions we have in our heads are completely, because to me, something annoying happens, sure, show that you're annoyed. But to be in that state is hurting you more than anybody around you. Nobody cares, right? And it's just that contemplation of like, the soul journey in that time it's so interesting especially when your parent i love you mum might be a younger soul than you you know our parents are always younger souls than us our children Ooh, our children okay. always are going to be older souls than we are so your children are going to look at you in some kind yeah. of way like a, yeah I can, he's already evolving. looking at me like that i'm like yeah. gosh <laughs> okay okay <laughs> that's so interesting tell me more about that so consciousness evolves so our children are more all yeah. So there are these um, things called yugas. It's like universal. Mm -hmm. It's like larger periods of like 10,000 or so years. And they'll have different frequencies that mm -hmm. the planet is in. So we are just coming out of Kali Yuga era of darkness. So this era of mm -hmm. darkness has been around war, you know, mm -hmm. poverty, you know, hatred crime like go like we've gone so 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 deep into the shadows like forgetting who we are and yeah. we've needed it's like it's a cycle that you need to go into this dissension to then remember again so we're actually coming out of kali yuga we can't say mm -hmm. the exact date some people say we've already shifted into the next one sat yuga era of truth some people say it's going to happen in 2029 some people say it's not going to happen for 100 years but we can all agree it's happening like right around now so we are the souls that have been chosen to come in this time. And so we're kind of the cleanup crew <laughs> that we were meant to 
come in in this era of darkness to see the darkness and to usher in this new way of being. That's why they call our souls like the volunteers. You know, like mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of just like the muck, like the setting the foundation for the new earth, like the people a hundred let alone 500,000 plus years from now, we're going to look at us like, thank you guys so much. How'd y'all do it? You know? So if you're like, shit is so crazy, what's happening? This is why we're at the end of Kali Yuga. So the souls that are coming through right now are actually more to be part of Sat Yuga. They're not meant to go through as many of the initiations that we had to go through. So a lot of us, you know, they call us the indigo children that we needed to be born with the difficult parents and the difficult lifestyles and the difficult things mm -hmm. to go on this journey of remembering. Whereas a lot of these children, actually those souls have chosen to have parents that are a bit more supportive of their path because they're here to do like really high level problems. Like like helping the planet, you know, saving the oceans, mm -hmm. like really big things that if they had to do so much of the like ancestral and family healing stuff, they wouldn't have been able to heavy do heavy lifting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You, you mentioned you're a Capricorn. I'm curious, is that in Vedic or in tropical astrology? That's in, two in, systems, in tropical. Isn't yes. In Western astrology and okay. Vedic, I am the Sagittarius. Okay, so how come you follow the tropical system? Well, I just say it to people because most people do it, but I actually follow Vedic astrology more in my day-to-day ah. -day life. But I do really like um, like the pattern app for like the bonds. I don't know if you've ever gone on them. I mean, yes, I've seen it. Yeah, you could get pretty like codependent on that, but I have found it to be very accurate. <laughs> I um, I'm a Virgo in tropical, and I'm a Leo in Vedic, so completely different. What do you, you feel know, more like? To um, I have the Leo essence in the Vedic sense of like honoring what I said, being very, um, protective over people I love and things like that. I'm forward camera facing, but, uh, my mind is a very Virgo Mercury mind so that I like to think a lot. I like to analyze situations and you know what I mean? It's a very like analytical mind. So both, but I don't know. I don't know. I just wanted We're to know both what like you earth follow. in the tropical and fire mm -hmm. in the in the Vedic. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like pizza and kapha. Yeah. I find in the Western world, I am more like my Western sign, like that Capricorn, mm -hmm. like I can do business and this and that, but my soul and the, who, the, the truth of who I am is definitely more of that Sagittarius energy. 100%. I feel the same. I wanted to just uh, say thank you for coming, but I also wanted to ask you to let people know where they can find these resources because they are so amazing. Like mm -hmm. your work is chef's kiss. Oh, well, I can't wait to have you on the podcast. And the best place to get the book, Discover Your Dharma, is you can go on imsaharose.com slash dharma. And there's a bunch of links you get on Amazon. It's it's in many different languages or wherever you buy your books. I have a quiz, dharmaarchetypequiz.com, D-H-A-R-M-A, archetypequiz.com. You can discover your unique dharma archetype. And we can link my website where you can find everything else. My Instagram is I am Sahar Rose. Podcast is Highest Self Podcast. So, oh my goodness, it flew by. It was such an honor to be here. And I'm so excited to hear the synchronicities that came through for people while listening to this. I'm so excited too. And you are going to be on another episode because there's so much more stuff I want to know. But I just want to give people the first, you know, tasty taste. initial taste. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for coming. You are wonderful. Thank you.